The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, open the word of truth to Romans chapter 10, verse 12, page 11 of your notes. And let's take the customary time to uh, make sure that uh, we are in the right place spiritually, you're in the right place physically, uh, get yourself in fellowship and make it the point that you're going to uh, go away from here with uh, a clarity with regard to uh, a couple verses we're going to cover this evening. I don't know if we'll have a shorter class, but we'll, have, we'll wait and see. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you. You continue to provide for us in every way so that we can be here, be edified and encouraged, and have fellowship with you and fellowship with one another based on sound doctrine. Bless this Bible class to that end, in Christ's name, amen. Before we start, I, want to, I just want to share this with you uh, real quick. Uh, I normally would not bring my uh, phone into the pulpit, but I did today. Uh, this is uh, Israeli news, and this is, you can look at this as Israel 365 news uh, that you can find online. Anyway, uh, the first thing is reenactment of the water libation held to prepare for the third temple and today's top stories. On the first one, on the first one, uh, it says, and I won't read the whole article, on Tuesday, a full dress reenactment of the water libation as it was performed in the temple was held in Jerusalem with several hundred participants led by the Kohanim, that's the, the Kohen, the priest, in priestly garb, you can see them in white here, uh, accompanied by Levites playing musical instruments. But this second article, thousands gather for once in seven years mitzvah. Tens of thousands of Jews gathered in the Western Wall Plaza to reenact the once in seven years mitzvah performed when all Jews are in Israel. But in addition, to this mass gathering, several smaller uh, reenactments took place, et cetera, et cetera. You can read it. They're blowing uh, silver trumpets and things of this nature. But the, the point of the whole thing was a seven-year count, a seven-year count. And it comes to a conclusion this weekend is my understanding. So uh, be ready for the rapture. If you're not ready, you're not ready. All right, verse 12. Salvation is open to all. This is something that needs repeating from time to time. Paul says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. <clears throat> for there is no difference, distinction, whatever word you prefer, diastole, the noun, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Uh, for the same Lord is Lord of all. The same Lord is Lord of all. Abounding in riches for all who call on him. This is yet another reference to uh, the, the prosperity that awaits believers uh, abounding in riches. Riches is the present active participle of pluteo. It means to be rich, wealthy. Abounding in riches uh, or uh, for all pos who call upon him. For whoever call will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a quote from the Old Testament. 
The word call is epikaleo, call upon. The epi is upon, call is the basic word to call something. It's the aorist subjunctive indicating potential on the name of the Lord will be saved, future tense, passive indicative. The, the individual, whoever that person is, uh, singular, uh, will be saved, sozo, one. The whoever of verse 13 is seen to be exactly that. As far as the provision of eternal salvation is concerned, God is no respecter of persons. Uh, uh, obviously, we would expect this of absolute perfection on the part of God with the divine attribute of justice uh, in your uh, diagram with the uh, essence triangle. Uh, justice means that God is fair and he deals with everybody on an equal basis. He does not make distinctions. And there are a number of scriptures which, of course, document this fact. Uh, the first one is Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality or take a bribe. And then in a, it's in a general context that judges who administer justice over people should not show partiality with regard to the people they're dealing with. Second Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians, Second Chronicles, nineteen seven, probably about the same thing, but it is it is stated because the the the, the function of people showing partiality is quite widespread. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful what you do. This, this context is he appointed judges in the land in all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city. This is King Jehoshaphat. He appointed judges because people have things they have to bring before the court and a ruling has to be made. And he said to the judges, consider what you're doing for you do not judge man, do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you when you render judgment. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful what you do, speaking to these judges, be care very careful what you do, for the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or taking a bribe which judges fall prey to historically. Job 34, it's just good to remember this. In God's dealing, he, he does not play favorites with regard to anything in his plan, and neither should we. <clears throat> 34, 19. Who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich above the poor, for they're all the work of his hands. Uh, Romans 2.11, which says simply, for there is no partiality with God. I think some of the literal Hebrew is when translated the word showing partiality, he does not regard a face. and put one above another. He deals with the facts before him and he makes a ruling based on the facts. Uh, Galatians 2, 6. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation 
contributed nothing to me. Now, there's a context here, and I'm not going to go into that. That's Paul's initial dealing with the other apostles uh, as he came on later. And Ephesians 6, verse, finally, and Ephesians 6, verse 9. This is dealing with individuals. In the, as I said, in the Roman world, there were slave owners who were Christians. And masters do the same things to them. Give up threatening. In other words, don't, uh, when you're dealing, you're dealing with other human beings, even though they're slaves, give up threatening. Knowing that both their master and yours, Christian, Christian slaves, and yours is in heaven. And there's no partiality with him. All mankind is placed under condemnation as a result of Adam's original sin and the presence of the sin nature. And so all mankind is equally condemned from birth or put under a sentence. And so all are equally in need of imputed righteousness. Um, Romans 1.6 Uh, okay, what do we got here? 16, excuse me. Paul, in his introduction to, this, to the Romans in his letter, he makes it very clear to them, as an individual, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm in this Roman world where a message is being proclaimed, the gospel, by Christians about a man who the Romans crucified and God raised from the dead. Crucifixion was, had the biggest stigma against it of execution. And the only people that ever, as far as I know, under the Roman rule, were crucified were non-citizens. If citizens of the Roman Empire did something requiring death, there was a different form of execution. But it was for non-citizens. So imagine going into the Roman world and presenting a crucified, but you have to add real quick, risen from the dead Savior. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Or the gospel. Why? Because it, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now that doesn't mean that the, only, the priority that the Jew had in the early going was, okay, they made a great contribution in history. Uh, we will, we will, we will, we'll be sure that they get an exposure to the gospel. Three nine. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Now, when you break this down as Jews and Greeks, you're thinking there's a whole lot of other different types of ra racial categories, right? This is as much or more a cultural distinction than it is a racial one. Yes, there is a racial distinction between a Jew and a Greek, but the Roman Empire, while it was ruled by the Roman people of Italy, we call it today, uh, <clears throat> they adopted, in large measure, Greek culture. That was the saying. They conquered the Greeks, but the Greeks conquered them with their culture. They were highly influenced by Greek culture. And Greek culture had been spread far beyond Greece as a result of the Alexander Conquest. I wanted to make that clear. Uh, <clears throat> 3.9, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are in the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. 
or put on notice, in other words. 3 and 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And 29, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also. In other words, the Gentiles were not written off at all. <clears throat> 411. And, and he, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. See, he was saved before he was circumcised. So that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised. Circumcision was a ritual for the age of Israel, starting with the uh, uh, giving of the Mosaic, uh, it was starting with Abraham. Ritual was in place and continued to be. But with the change of dispensations, uh, circumcision is no longer an operative ritual in the sense of God requiring it of Jews even, or Gentiles. Of course, Jews all practice it today, but uh, the Gentile, without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. Circumcision was a visible sign of the isolation of the STA. In this little simple procedure, the removal of the foreskin and the discarding of it indicates isolation of the STA. And the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but also who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. So from age 75, he was a believer before that, but circumcision was never a ritual. The people from Adam on, they, they were not told to follow this ritual. It was, it, was, it was inaugurated with, it, with Abraham when he was called out of Ur. Uh, no, it wasn't inaugurated then. Excuse me, I misspoke. When Abraham was called, he was already a believer. And, from age, and, and then from the time of his call, I'll get my facts straight here, from age 75 to age 100, a full 25 years, he lived and served God in an uncircumcised state. Fact. It's a fact of the Old Testament. So what he says is that this ritual does not, does not confer salvation. Those who follow in the steps of the faith of our Abraham, of Abra our father Abraham, he's speaking to Roman Gentiles who calls Abraham, our father, he is not our racial father, unless you're a Jew. He is our spiritual father. In the human realm, he is our spiritual father role model. He's one who was picked for that. Everything about his history speaks volumes in this regard. Here was, well, he lived to be, what was it, one, one, uh, 75 or something like that, 150, I, I forgot exactly. But he lived, lived, I think, to be 175. He went on to live uh, after that. And everything Abraham did is what a believer ought to do as it pertains to him. He left his homeland. Now, you don't have to leave your homeland. But he left a locale, a nice comfy locale, and launched out on faith, took his wife and Lot and started a new business. Whatever his business was back in Ur with his father, that was all dropped. And five years later, 
He, after leaving this, he packs up everything. He changes his life from sedentary to nomadic. Now, you don't have to do that. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have to be willing to make whatever changes you need to make in order to get yourself in the geographical will of God. If you're already in it and it's there and it's easy in that regard, fine. If that's what it takes to get under sound teaching, because it isn't in every community by a long shot. And serve God in the land made, made <clears throat> used rebound, because he'd get out of fellowship over something. He uh, finally hit, hit maturity. He never allowed the long years of being childless to throw him completely off track and say, oh, this, no, none of this works and I'm, I'm out of here. He was a man of faith. We follow in the steps of Abraham, the principles that he implemented, we are to implement. Separation from negative volition. Starting a new career, of which he was successful. He stumbled on time occasion, the, 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 the running off to Egypt thing due to a famine, and then, the, and then lying about who Sarah was before the Pharaoh, because Sarah was, at that time in her life, exceedingly attractive. But they'd already made an agreement. It wasn't like, how could you do this to me? They'd made an agreement. In other words, they weren't faith resting that, right? If God tells you, you're going to be the father of a great nation and all this is going to come from flow from you, you under the Abrahamic covenant, I'm giving you real estate, you're in it right now, but you don't, it's not yours now. Enjoy it. Explore it. It's for you and your descendants forever. And so uh, he never, he never failed to hang in there and stick with it. Uh, that's following in the steps of Abraham. He was obedient. Okay, there were those episodes that uh, he got under fear. But he'd get, his, he'd get it back together again, and away we go. He was serving God and following God and not his own interests. But that was his best interest, as it always is, for the believer who decides to hang in there. We're going to find this out big time. Uh, all right. Uh, and, of course, over here, 924. Just... Even us, whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. So in verse 12, Jew and Greek is both a cultural and a racial distinction. You could even, for Greek, you could substitute the word Gentile. But it's Greek. Everyone understood what he was talking about. So is both a cultural and a racial distinction, as in Romans 1, 16, 2, 9, 10, and Colossians 3, 11. All who are saved, Jesus is Lord of all. Regardless of race, gender, social standing, or anything else you could possibly name. The divine attribute of justice, fairness, means that God cannot, for unknown reasons, turn away anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. When humans exhibit partiality, they engage in sinful behavior. 
And these are some scriptures uh, that are that admonish and talk about this uh, bad human characteristic that we see in a lot of people. Showing partiality. It's, it's rampant out there among people. I mean, uh, <clears throat> how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Uh, a lot of Christians are guilty of this. They'll fall all over someone that comes in the church and appears to have money. I'll probably never I'll probably I'll never have it happen, I'll say that. But if some big celebrity that we knew in the cosmos came here, they're gonna be treated just like anyone else. Without saying these acts words, sit down, shut up, and listen to doctrine. You're you're starting off new. Whatever you were in, are in the cosmos, man, is, it doesn't impress God in the least. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> Proverbs 24, 23. These are the sayings of the wise. To show partiality in judgment is not good. And well, that's more probable within a legal context, but, this, but, but the principle applies. 1 Timothy 5, 21. Maybe you saw a lot of it when you went to school, you know. The, 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 uh, I'll find it one of these days. Sorry. Wrong direction, once again. My apologies. <clears throat> First Timothy 5.21. Paul speaking to his protege, pastor teacher. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and his chosen angels to, ma to maintain these principles without, without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality, not favoring certain members of the church over others for whatever reasons. Apply this even-handedly. And James 2.9. They were, uh, among these Christians, there were incidences of, in these churches to whom James writes this letter, Jewish churches happened to be, made up of Jews, in the land of Israel at the time, uh, they were showing partiality. There was some grotesque examples of this. And he's rebuking this mess, so they'll quit it. The churches of Judea, the land of Israel in James' day, were experiencing economic hardships due to persecution, due to a general famine and other things. And in this letter, he says, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism, verse one. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. You made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil, evil motives. 
Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world? This is the economic poor. Did he not choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Is not the rich, is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? These rich Jews? So, you know, he's not saying treat the rich man bad because rich men are doing this out here, but be even-handed. Yeah, it is amazing. The Apostle Peter learned the principle that Jews and Gentiles were equal in the matter of the plan of God in a, in a way as never before. When I say never before, we're talking about the church age and in Acts 10, uh, here, we have an incident. Peter, this is on the coast, we visited this place too, Caesarea, it was a Roman, it was a port, they built it. They knew how to make, get concrete to set up underwater. And they built, they built a fort there. And uh, And uh, there's a whole context here. And Peter is, you know, uh, okay, I'm going to go into a Gentile's house and whatever. Um, on the next day, he got up and went away with them. And some of the brethren, verse 23, he, oh, so he invited them in and gave them lodging. And on the next day, he got up and went up with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him, and on the following day entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped. But Peter raised him up, saying, see, he's real impressed with Peter. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. But Peter raised him up, saying, stand up. I, too, am just a man. And he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man holy or unclean. And uh, so this occasion led to what we have in verse 34 where Peter says in a speech to this crowd of Gentiles, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is no one to show partiality. Because in the Jewish mind, this big separation between them and those Gentiles out there. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And uh, the result of this, this speech of Peter, we have the Gentile Pentecost. And that these Gentiles were being baptized in the Spirit the same as the Jews did back on the day of Pentecost. So Peter had to make this transition in his, and come around full blown in his thinking, they're equal. And of course, in this dispensation, there is neither Jew nor Greek. The distinctions, I don't mean there isn't. I mean, this, this, it's a non-issue. It's a non-issue what your race is. Uh, the expression of bounty and riches refers to the blessings that come to all who call on him. Riches come in a variety of forms and include phase two and phase three advantages. As a believer now, you can rebound and be filled with the Spirit. And that's, that's 
that's something you can't put a price on. You can get in fellowship and call on God, make your request known before the throne of his grace. Uh, you've, got, you've got insights and things that the, the non-believer doesn't have or the, even the person without any understanding. And then the phase three advantages. Verse 13 is scriptural confirmation to the Old Testament of the assertion in verse 12. The quote is from Joel 2.32. The context of that citation has to do with the Jews living in the tribulation. But Paul applies the principle to all humanity regardless of the dispensation. He applies it to all humanity that whoever will make the salvation adjustment will receive the advantages associated with the salvation adjustment, and they are monumental. The greatest decision you and I made in our lives was to believe in Christ. We stepped free from the condemnation we were born under, and even though we didn't know it, uh, we have all this, the afterlife, the kingdom of God, the resurrection body, and now with doctrine, the building up of your eternal rewards account and all these other factors. So this is where the real wealth is. The wealth of the world passes away with the death of rich people. And of course, in the day of the Lord, all of it's gonna be brought down. All these American billionaires running around are gonna be reduced to extreme conditions. American wealthy people, it's not going to do them any good to speak of. So the whoever regarding salvation advantage is seen throughout Scripture. Uh, and it includes, again, all of us, all humanity. Anybody can have it. It's free. It's a gift. God wants people to be saved, but he can only put it in front of them and it's up to them to act on it. All right, we'll have a little shorter class tonight. I'll see you Sunday. If we don't get raptured, I'll see you anyway. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us in Christ's name, amen.